If you like the show and you like to keep us around, why not support us at patreon.com forward slash geeky keys. For as little as $1 or more a month, you can get access to things like early episodes and much, much more. Simply go to patreon.com forward slash geeky keys and click on become a patron. That's patreon.com forward slash geeky keys. Welcome back to another great episode of the Geeky Keys podcast show. In this episode, we are covering two awesome topics, one of which is going to be the new theory on Mars and its formation. Yes, you might be thinking, well, what was so wrong about the old one? We will be talking about it today. And also, we're going to be covering the war on age and why it sucks. But (laughs) don't worry, people are working on it, you know. And we're going to be talking about some of those ways in this episode. So we will see you straight after this. Welcome back. Let's jump straight into our first topic for today. And we're talking about the new theory on Mars and its formation. Right? Now, we're all familiar with the story of how the inner rocky planets were formed at the beginning of our solar system. And we had quite strong evidence for it as well. Now, of course, we're talking about Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. And we always group these four planets together in a sort of formation theory, quote-unquote. But were we too hasty in including Mars in this theory as well? Now, if you're thinking, how different are these theories really from one another? then we need to kind of weigh them up against each other. And let's start with the most well-known of which. The theory that emerged was that the sun was surrounded by a cloud of dust and gas. And as that cloud cooled, little grains of minerals formed. So all these little grains of minerals floating in this gaseous cloud are moving around the sun and they start to bump into each other. So what we're looking at is the assemblage of all these little ancient, ancient, ancient materials that were floating around the sun in the nebula of dust and gas. And when they hit each other, they gradually aggregated into solid bodies, which got bigger and bigger. All right, so now that we know how these rocky planets of our solar system were formed, how different could the birth of Mars then really be? Well, for one, the new evidence show that Mars, the aptly named red planet, might not have shared its birth with Earth and its neighbors. The report in the June 15th Earth and Planetary Science Letters proposed a better explanation of why Mars has such a different chemical composition than Earth and uses the model of the fairly recent way of thinking, planetary migration. Simulating the assembly of the solar system around 4.56 billion years ago, researchers proposed that the red planet didn't form in the inner solar system alongside the other terrestrial planets as previously thought. Mars instead may have formed around where the asteroid belt is now and migrated inward to its present-day orbit. A very interesting new way of looking at planetary development and formation. And quite frankly, I think it puts science at its core on showcase here. It's not just a one and done situation when it comes to scientific research. We don't just look at a topic and say, well, guess we covered it, let's move on. It's about putting the ideas that we think we know a lot about on trial and seeing if we were right. And I think that very idea is what molds so perfectly into our next topic, which is the war on age. Now, since the dawn of mankind, humans have been looking for ways to increase its lifespan. Searching for the so-called fountain of youth is one of the oldest and still one of the most relevant ideas known to man. And it's because it's rooted in our most basic programming, the will to survive. Now, modern medicine has done what our forefathers could only dream of, increasing our life expectancy that was between 30 to 40 years old in the 1800s to a projected average life expectancy of 85 years in the next 30 years, average across the entire planet. Now, this very process of prolonging our lives gained momentum like no other time in human history, and this was all thanks to the discovery of DNA and genes. 
We know that DNA is sort of like a shoelace. It has plastic tips at the end. Every time a cell reproduces, the tips get shorter and shorter and shorter until finally they fray. And you know that your shoelace without the plastic tips will simply fall apart. That's what happens inside a cell. A cell, for example, your skin cell, will divide about 60 times. That's called the Hayflick limit. Then the cell goes into senescence and eventually dies. Now, also you have to realize that genes are also very essential for the aging process. It turns out that we know what aging is. Aging is the buildup of error. That's all aging is, the buildup of genetic and cellular error. As cells begin to age, they begin to get sluggish because genetic mistakes start to build up. Now, cells, however, have a repair mechanism. They can repair damage to their cells. Otherwise, we would all basically rot uh, very soon after birth. Now, the idea of speeding up gene repair is not exactly a new one. I mean, we've had things from skin products to help with sun damage or to fight wrinkles, and even all the way to gene editing tools like CRISPR that has revolutionized gene editing. A few years ago, something called clustered regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats, or CRISPR, burst into the scene. It worked so well, scientists began issuing ethical statements about its use. CRISPR cuts DNA strands with unprecedented accuracy and simplicity, allowing geneticists to directly edit any of Earth's organisms however they like. CRISPR could be used to engineer disease-free organisms, formulate high-yield crops, or even cure genetic and hereditary human conditions. Of course, it could theoretically also be used to let parents pick their kids' sex, eye color, height, or whatever. In the end, CRISPR is, as one Nobel scientist said to the Independent, jaw-dropping in its efficiency and simplicity. Now at the end of it all, a simple yet very complex question arises, one that will not only shape the future by changing how humanity looks at itself, and by self, I mean what is defined as being human. Should we continue to try and fight the processes of nature, tweaking this very sensitive structure of ourselves, or should we get rid of it altogether and move on to what has become more than just an extension of ourselves, technology. In other words, get rid of the bio and move to the robo. Believe it or not, even though tens of thousands of papers have been written about consciousness in the literature, nobody has a suitable definition for consciousness. What does it mean to be conscious and how do you encode it? And what is the minimum amount of consciousness necessary to animate something else? This raises questions for artificial intelligence because some people in the field of AI believe that one day we will be immortal. We will live forever. But the question is, what will live forever? The atoms that make up our body, that give us consciousness, that give rise to our personality and our fears and desires, that may die but yet the essence of the neural circus may survive. The most ambitious has been proposed by uh, people uh, who believe that one day we will create a robot body that is perfect. A Superman, beautiful, elegant, super powerful body with no brain. Then we will start to extract our brain tissue, neuron for neuron, and duplicate it to, with transistors. So for every neuron we take out of our brain, we replace it with a transistor. Sooner or later, chunks of our brain are removed and inserted transistor for transistor inside this robot body. Now I think the one question that matters above all else is the question of human identity. Let's just say the technological singularity were to happen today and you had the choice of basically uploading your consciousness to a machine or to a server. The question you will be asking yourself is not, is this going to make me live forever, sort of make me immortal? I think the question that we will all face is, will I lose my identity? Because think about it, it's the one thing that human beings prize above all else our very identity, the thing that makes us better than any other animal on this planet, all right? So it's more of a ethical, sort of a philosophical question. How much of a human being can you replace for it to stop being a human being? 
So yeah, we got a lot of obstacles to overcome when it comes to fighting the war on age. Especially when you look at how people are fighting genetically engineered crops and all those other things. And those are small things compared to what we talked about now. So yeah, tell us what you think on our SoundCloud page.com forward slash geeky keys as well as on our Twitter and Facebook page. And uh, go visit our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash geeky keys. Support the show. Leave us a comment. Tell us what you think. And, uh, you know, leave your questions there and we'll try and answer them on the show as well. So, yeah, thank you so much for tuning in. Once again, we will see you on the flip side.